Welcome to Standard 6A. The goal of this presentation is to describe a period of history known as the Scientific Revolution and explain some of its effects. The essential question we're looking to answer in this presentation is what were some of the new scientific theories and discoveries that emerged during the scientific revolution. A revolution of any sort is a change. So what were some of the changes? What were some of the new theories and the new discoveries of this period? Our essential understanding, uh, it helps to realize that the scientific revolution was a period of time when the scientists really began stressing, observing, and measuring things in order to make scientific conclusions. Prior to the scientific revolution, a lot of European science was based off of religious belief and off of the ancient learning of other civilizations, particularly the ancient Greeks. And those two areas uh, influence a lot of European science. The, the scientific revolution is going to uh, reduce the influence of those two things and replace them with observation and measurement. For our essential knowledge, we're looking to uh, know about five pioneers of the scientific revolution. A pioneer refers to anybody who was first or early on in a particular area. So we're looking really at five uh, early scientists in the scientific revolution who were very important. The first of these uh, scientists was a Polish astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus. Uh, astronomers are scientists who study outer space. Uh, and in his uh, study of outer space, Copernicus is going to develop the heliocentric theory. Helio comes from the uh, Greek word helios for sun. So heliocentric refers to a sun-centered model of the solar system. We don't need to know this guy, but just so we can see where Copernicus is coming from, uh, as we mentioned, a lot of European science was based on earlier civilizations learning. Here we see an Egyptian uh, astronomer, actually he was of Greek uh, background, but lived in Egypt, uh, named Ptolemy. And Ptolemy put together a model of the solar system that looked like the one we see on the screen here. And Ptolemy placed the Earth at the center of the solar system. And this was known as the geocentric model. This model of the solar system held for thousands of years until Copernicus comes along and says, sorry Ptolemy, that's not really what I'm seeing in my calculations. Copernicus replaces the heliocentric theory with, uh, re re sorry, replaces the geocentric theory with the heliocentric theory. And as we see in this model, he moves the Earth out of the middle and places the Sun in the middle. Another astronomer uh, we need to know here is a German astronomer named Johann Kepler. And Kepler develops the laws of planetary motion, which stated that planets move in, uh, in paths called ellipses. Okay, so they had elliptical orbits or circles around the sun. Okay, again, if we go back to the ancient Greeks, uh, the Greeks really, really liked circles. They saw circles as the perfect shape. Uh, and because the universe was uh, kind of a big deal, uh, they believed that the planets revolved around, uh, revolved around in circles. Okay, the uh, Greek philosopher Plato put forth uh, kind of this idea of the circular movement of the planets, uh, again, around the Earth, not around the, the sun. We see the Greek planets the way they lined up. Okay, with the sun being one of them going around the earth. Okay, just like uh, Copernicus replacing the old way of thinking, Kepler replaced that old way of thinking as well. I'm not a scientist. I, I, this is a lot of this is way above my head in terms of uh, deep explanation of it. But there are a lot of movements of the planets that just didn't make sense 
if they were moving in perfect circles. Okay, and Kepler is going to replace the circular motion of the planets with the ellipse. The ellipse almost like an oval, kind of a squashed circle. Okay, and we see a more familiar pattern here of the planets as they move in these elliptical orbits, uh, which were spelled out in the laws of planetary motion. Okay, another scientist we need to know, and possibly one you've heard of before, is a guy named Galileo Galilei, or more commonly just uh, known as Galileo. Galileo develops the piece of technology known as the astronomical telescope. And with that, he's able to support Copernicus's heliocentric theory. Okay, Copernicus was really just theory. A theory is an idea. Uh, but it takes some more work in order to prove it. Not everybody was a fan of Copernicus's work. Copernicus's view that the Earth wasn't the center uh, kind of ran up into some religious opposition. From a religious standpoint, not just the Catholic Church, uh, some of the Protestant religions, some other religions as well, uh, there was a belief that the Earth was the center. And that just sort of lined up nicely with religious beliefs uh, that, that placed human life and, and the Earth at the center of, of a religiously created uh, universe and, and, and system. Okay, we see here the um, important uh, Italian cardinal during the same time that the scientific revolution was going on, Roberto Bellamino, uh, who's, who gives this quote here that the sun is in the heavens and moves swiftly around the earth. The earth is far from the heavens and stands immobile in the center of the universe. So he's really kind of summarizing the Catholic Church's view of the solar system which places the earth at the center and the sun is as something revolving around the earth. Galileo now with his telescope is able to give much more support to Copernicus's theory. Okay, Galileo uh, as we see here there's the telescope. Telescopes had been around but they were almost like a toy. You might picture the explorers like Columbus his crew had telescopes so maybe they could see a mile or so out across the ocean looking for land. To see into outer space you needed a much more powerful piece of technology and that's what uh, Galileo develops here. The problem for Galileo is this is all going down during the Reformation, going back to Standard 3. And the, the church at the time really wasn't in any mood to um, listen to dissenters. While the church was uh, busy trying to prevent the Protestant Reformation from spreading more, here's Galileo now challenging a view of the Catholic Church, and the church not wanting to admit that it might possibly be wrong on this, uh, is actually going to put Galileo on trial, and we see him in this painting, on trial before the Inquisition those religious courts. Galileo is a very religious guy. In fact, two of his daughters were Catholic nuns, and yet Galileo is sentenced to 12 years of house arrest um, because of his, of his scientific findings. As we see here, Galileo's famous quote, supposedly he said, the Bible says how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Okay, back down here on Earth, um, some, uh, sign, some people might consider Isaac Newton to be the most important scientist. For those of you who are really into science, you know Gal uh, Newton does a lot more than just the laws of gravity. But again, going back to the ancient Aristotle, had this view of uh, the elements uh, that really categorized everything into four elements into water elements, air elements, fire elements, and earth elements. And the idea that Aristotle and the ancient Greeks had was that uh, objects kind of fell to their like substance. Okay, so water would go to water, air would lift up to air, uh, solid earth objects would fall to the earth, that that's really what was responsible 
for things falling in the direction that they would fall. The Greeks also um, believed that it was the weight of an object that determined its fall to earth. Heavier objects would fall faster than lighter objects. Newton, again, uh, you know, through, through physics, is able to prove that that's not the case. Okay, in reality, um, as Newton sits under the apple tree, according to legend, and the apple falls on his head, being a scientist, he asks why. You or I might get mad at the apple and pick it up and throw it. Uh, Newton looks at it and says, why does it fall down? How come it didn't float up? How come it doesn't become loose from the tree and go to the side? Okay, Newton says there must be something acting on the apple to cause it to fall down. Okay, and it's through Newton's laws of gravity that we know it's not the weight of the object that determines its speed that it falls. Gravity is acting on both heavy and, and uh, light objects at the same, uh, same rate. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether something's water or air or an earth element. Gravity is always pulling things down to the center of the earth. Okay, and then our last uh, of our five pioneer scientists is William Harvey, who discovered the circulation of the blood. Okay, going back again to the ancient Greeks, a Greek physician named Galen uh, came up with a system of the circulatory system. The Greeks believed the blood just kind of moved around our body on its own. They understood that there were veins and, and plumbing inside of our bodies carrying the blood, but they didn't really understand how it moved. Galen and the other uh, Greek scientists believed that the, the heart really was just a heater for the blood, and that as the blood kind of just made its way through the body, the heart just heated up the blood. Okay, of course, we know that's not really the case. Harvey comes along and realizes that the heart's not a heater, it's actually the pump. Okay, and that pump then is what's responsible for circulating the blood through the human body. Okay, and the veins and arteries and capillaries are all part of that circulatory system. Okay, we have one other essential question here, which what, what, were, what were some of the effects of these new theories and discoveries? And we really have three here. We want to know these three effects of the scientific revolution. The first is we have an emphasis on reason and systematic observation of nature now. Uh, scientists can't just say something is true based on um, some earlier belief or on a particular religious belief. There needs to be um, much more observation and a, a much more systematic way of going about science and simply saying something is so. Okay, that kind of leads into our second thing is we had here the formulation of what you probably know from your science classes as the scientific method. Okay, scientists before doing an experiment, they make a prediction or a hypothesis, they then conduct an experiment, they observe what happens, and then based on that experiment and their observations, they make a theory to test out. Okay, and that system of, of testing and, and observing and theorizing, that comes out of this period of time as well. Okay, and then our last one here is we do have a, a much bigger expansion of scientific knowledge. Okay, scientific knowledge becomes something evolving instead of something static. Before the scientific revolution, scientists just sort of accepted uh, science that had been developed centuries before. Now we live in a world where science is a constantly evolving uh, area of study. Okay, and there's all sorts of new fields of study in science. Okay, and that's also a legacy of this period of time. Okay, and with that we'll go ahead and wrap up Standard 6A.